<coughs> All right, so I, I apologize for the last minute rescheduling. Uh, you can see my voice still not fully recovered. So uh, it's a half empty room. If you want to hear me better, you can move forward. I couldn't speak very loud today anyway. Uh, so I had a couple of slides left from uh, last time on uh, finishing off the, the particle filter. If you remember, particle filter is an instance of the real weighted to important sampling, right? And uh, we basically, the idea is that uh, you are not going to get only the samples like here. You're going to also uh, you know, associate with each sample a weight so that now your balls, you know, these, these are basically the samples. Uh, now they are of different sizes. The size reflects the weights they get. And uh, then you are going to uh, use uh, these uh, weighted samples as a representation of a distribution. So in this particular case, which we call particle filter, just to see a few words, you know, we are going to want to sample from uh, a, a distribution, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, a predictive state conditioning on all the observation sequences, like x t plus one given y one to t plus one. And the way to do that is to repetitively use uh, reweighted important sampling in two steps. Right? The first step is called the time updates. We assume that we are coming from here. At time t, we already have a collection of samples which are weighted that represents this distribution, okay? And uh, you can see it's coming from here, sample plus their weights. And then to move one step forward, we're going to first apply a time updates to use these samples and their weights to define a distribution like this, which is almost like a mixture model, okay? It is uh, you know, a uh, conditional distribution of the next state, xt plus one, given the current state, xt. So here there's nothing to do with observation, it's just a transitional probability. But uh, the conditioning state is now represented by the sample. You just plug in the sample M. And the M, of course, has a weight as well. Right? So you draw this sample, like what you get here. These are basically your newly drawn sample from this weighted predictive distribution. And then you're going to do a measurement update. So where do you actually incorporate this new piece of observation, t, yt plus one? Well, you do that by using this equation, but operationally, Basically, you are going to now use uh, this, you know, this uh, emission probability of uh, yt plus one given xt plus one <coughs> to compute the normalized weights, okay? So every sample coming from here will receive a new weight. That's why the same sample you see here, which is coming from here, is now, you know, changing their size. And the size actually corresponds to the weights. It's not roughly, analytically represented by this curve. But uh, once you weigh them, you're going to now you know, blow up or shrink the importance of every sample like this. And then we are moving one step further. Right? You have uh, this collection of weighted samples, which is now for t plus one, and here it is for t. So you move one step forward. So this is called particle filter because uh, you know, all these samples look like a particle, and they are filtered by these uh, weights. Okay, computed from new observations. So it's a very, very uh, handy and effective algorithm for you know, online inference. Imagine you have uh, a complicated model like this one. You know, this is a model known as the switching state space model. You probably heard about that before already, right? It is uh, built on a number of uh, common filters, but uh, with a single observation. Why? So imagine here are your uh, signal on the radar and uh, say uh, of uh, aircrafts. But uh, out there, you know, the radar is uh, looking at the entire airspace. There may be multiple uh, such, uh, you, know, uh, you know, aircrafts flying. But you say you see maybe a single uh, trajectory, then you may want to ask maybe at a certain point they come from a different uh, aircrafts. And then here I have this uh, HMM chain, you know, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, di dictating uh, from which of the aircraft this uh, particular observation is coming from. Right. So this is called a switching state space model. And its inference is very complicated, right? Because, uh, you know, in here, you know, you have uh, 
you know, say that's starting from the very beginning. This one generates a Gaussian distribution, and this one generates a Gaussian distribution, right? And then once you move into the next state, you know, the whole thing can come from uh, any combinations of the Gaussian distribution. Therefore, you actually, you know, get to blow up into more things, and then more and more you get, you know, the, basically this one could be a mixture of Gaussian, two Gaussians, and that one could be another mixture of two Gaussians. Right? And at the end of the day, you are going to get more and more such mixture components. Therefore, the inference is very complicated. People don't know how to exact the inference. And uh, in the sampling case, what you are going to do is to just uh, run this uh, particle filter. Right? You are going to use this as the transition probability. There are two transition probabilities from uh, S to the other S and from X to the other X. And then the emission is basically a, uh, you know, a Gaussian mixture model. And then you basically just uh, use the, the equation we had before, okay, to plug in, you know, the transition, which is in, in, uh, in here, right, to a sample, uh, in here, which is the transition probability to sample the new samples for the next stage, and then you use the emission to compute the weights. So it's all like a local operation. You don't have to look at the entire state sequences when you do the inference. So uh, <clears throat> that's basically what the particle filtering is uh, used for, you know, for a sequential Monte Carlo inference. So that's basically all the uh, ideas I want to talk about from last lecture, you know, how to do a uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, not Markov chain, Monte Carlo algorithms, and to sample complete distribution. And here I have one more trick before I move on. It's called uh, uh, a raw black, uh, black valorization or black horizon sampling. This black wall is uh, a statistician in UC Berkeley, uh, you know, many, many years ago. And uh, he and Rao invented, uh, you know, a additional trick to uh, speed up sampling. Uh, and uh, I put it at the last, but uh, at the beginning of the next lecture, because uh, this technique is a very generic one. It can be applied to any sampling procedure on any distributions. And the idea is the following. You know, remember we are doing graphical models, and by definition, graphic model is a uh, multivariate distribution, right? It's not about a single variable. In the graph, in the, in the pictures I showed before, you always see like a density function like this, and this is basically a one-dimensional distribution. It's just a, a single random variable. But uh, now you have to deal with the fact that you need to sample from a multivariate distribution. So, uh, in a simpler case, you may have a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Then you draw sample quite easily from that. But if, what if I have a complex cases where I have uh, discrete random variables, you know, uh, continuous random variables, and many other things? And at the end of the day, I have this uh, giant X, which has uh, many, many, you know, different uh, uh, states, you know, of variables in this uh, whole collection. That's basically a graphical model, right? and. Uh, how to sample that? Well, remember, we have this uh, naive sampling in which we just uh, traverse the graphical model and uh, sample from the root, right, and uh, use that to condition the next one and so on, which is very efficient. And uh, here I have one idea to make that a little bit more efficient, which is uh, maybe I don't need to sample everything, okay? There may be some cases, you know, the reason for, you know, you wanting to sample uh, sometimes it's because uh, there is a uh, you know very uh, complicated distribution that you don't know what it's, what the closed form look like, right? That's one reason. But in some cases, for example, if uh, I really want you to sample a Gaussian random variable, or I want to deal with a Gaussian inference, always uh, a uh, uh, if you remember the Dirichlet distribution, which is uh, basically theta half plus one, something like that, right? So for this kind of distribution, do you really want to apply a sample to compute its expectation or other things, or do you rather do a, 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 a closed form expectation or integration? What do you prefer? At least for Gaussian, for example. So probably, you know, even though I use Gaussian to uh, as a running example to derive the sampling algorithm, but uh, in reality, the sampling algorithm are probably used for more fancy applications, right? Gaussian probably can be taken care of just by closed form integration, right? So in that case, 
you may want to look at uh, the actual random variables in this list. And there may be some variables, you know, maybe somewhere in the middle, that actually follows a, uh, a Gaussian distribution conditioned on some other random variable. Say this is xi, then I could say x minus i. Other random variables, you know, that is uh, in this list. And this one is just a conditional Gaussian. So in that case, if you have all the other nodes or variables already sampled, then you actually have a closed form expression of this particular conditional distribution P of xi given x minus i. And that one, according to our previous uh, running example, you should sample from it. But if your goal is to compute expectation, you may just want to do a closed form. Yeah, so that's the idea about the uh, raw black realization, which is that suppose you want to compute a uh, expectation of some functions over a high dimensional distribution, then what you can do is to identify two classes of citizens. Okay? One is called P, the other is called D, and uh, you are going to actually uh, you know, uh, sample only from, uh, uh, only generate sample for the XP, but not for XD. Okay? And the correctness is, in, is actually shown by this proof. Right? You know, you, if you do a, you know, uh, this expectation, then you can pretty much uh, do a you know, stepwise integration and uh, take the P out of it, and uh, here you integrate over XD given XP. Okay? And uh, now suppose that uh, 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 maybe uh, uh, integrating over P is rather hard. But uh, in this way, if you know the P value, the XP value, and integrating the XD given P is easy, say in this case a Gaussian distribution, then why don't you just compute the, the closed form of that? Right. So in this case, I can basically uh, you know, compute a closed form, like what I did here, which is now conditioning on the XP, okay, which is uh, a, a value to be sampled from. And that basically leads to this expression. Here, you have a combination of using closed form integration and also using sample-based integration. So here, you draw samples from the XP, which is a sub-vector of the original full vector to be sampled. And that's usually you know, a lower dimensional distribution where you can generate a sample more easily. And then once you have the XP, you are going to use it to define a conditional distribution. I think here, uh, you didn't see a, a slash which is to be conditioning on, and then you are going to compute you know, the integration over the remaining random variables in closed form. Okay. And this idea is called the raw black relation. On the first side, you should have the intuition that at least it allows you to sample less, right? Some random variables that don't have to be sampled. But there are also other benefits. Here I raised just one. You know, usually you can prove actually these kind of samples will have a low variance, okay? And uh, I'm not going to prove that. You can actually, uh, you know, draw that conclusion from here. The variance of uh, this, uh, you know, uh, pair of samples, okay? And this uh, whole sample, basically, XP and XD, which is uh, the entire set of random variables, is actually uh, expressible by the summation of these two. Okay, and among these two, there are variants of uh, the subsamples, okay, which is uh, the sample based on uh, the distribution conditioning on these samples. <clears throat> and uh, you can therefore show that uh, you know you your 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 partially sample driven kind of uh, 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 calculation will get a low variance than the full sample driven calculation. That's all I want to say. So this raw black realization technique will be uh, further discussed in the rest of, in later part of this lecture, in the particular example where you can see a lot of advantage. But the idea is pretty much here. Just uh, you know, sample a subset of random variable and leave the rest for a closed form integration. Okay, that's the whole idea. So with that, I want to give you a quick summary of Monte Carlo methods, the basic Monte Carlo methods. We talked about direct sampling rejection sampling, likelihood weighting, and these are for you know, sampling arbitrary distribution, and we'll talk about the pros and cons of each method. Now, from now and uh, until into the next lecture, I'm going to spend some more time to discuss another 
much you know, more uh, popular, uh, more uh, widely practiced approach called uh, Markov Chen Pumacalo, which is now uh, appear to be taking over these three methods for some good reason. Okay. In fact, these three methods are mostly invented for low dimensional sampling. If you have a small vector, say uh, you know, a, a fancy one dimensional distribution where you don't know the closed form shape of that, or you know, a two or three dimensional distribution where you want to generate quick samples, these three are often used. But for really large graphical model based distribution where you have a lot of random variables, for example, in the topic model, you have how many random variables? A lot, right? Because every document needs to have a topic vector and every word in the topic model, uh, in the document, needs to have a topic indicator. That's a lot of words, a lot of variables. And in that kind of distribution, this kind of technique can be very, very slow. And therefore, MCMC is uh, a technique where people found to be uh, easy to apply to those problems. So with that, I'm going to open a new lecture that was meant for today. Any questions before I sleep, uh, when I'm flipping slides? Any questions so far on the Monte Carlo methods we got so far? OK, if no, let me uh, move on. So uh, today's lecture is, again, uh, a bit technical, it's long, but I hope you will find it eventually you know, uh, quite straightforward and uh, easy to implement. In fact, uh, MCMC is the preferred method in many of the graphic model inference problem, exactly because of its simplicity. You know, once you understand the whole mechanism and uh, put the theory behind you, operationally, it's much easier than variational inferences, speedy propagations, and uh, you know, uh, uh, mean field and stuff like that, because uh, what? The, because you don't need to do a lot of uh, calculation and inference. Okay. So again, this is the recap. I don't think uh, we can, uh, we need uh, recap much because I, we are just like uh, covering that. Okay, so maybe uh, it is important to recap on the limitation of the Montag methods before we can uh, start this new technique. So uh, if you see the, the whole roadmap that I used to present Monte Carlo methods, I keep saying that, well, we need to sample from a difficult distribution, which we couldn't. We need to get a simpler one. Then all we did for rejection sampling, important sampling, and others is to uh, prevent the, the, the proposal distribution, which is the easier one that we use to harm us, right? Because they are suboptimal in many ways. Right, we, we, we run into stories like uh, maybe the rejection rate was too high so that many samples are not useful, right? Or uh, maybe the, the sample uh, is uh, misleading because uh, their variance is not very big even though they are not very representative, right? stuff like that. And maybe even there are multimodal distribution. You know, if you run enough such experiments, you will see for multimodal, if your proposal is not very nice, it can get you completely stuck in one modality and moving you know, without being able to move out of uh, the modality. And we will see some examples later. So with all these uh, problems and uh, that coming from this queue, okay, uh, we're going to you know, investigate a new way of uh, picking you know, the queues, the proposal distribution. We still need Q because if we don't need Q, then we're going back to the story of dealing with P, which is our original problem, which is very hard, right? But the, the, the highlight here is that how to uh, be smart or be smarter about uh, picking the, the good queue. So for the algorithms that we talked about above, you may now recognize that uh, we are using a fixed queue, okay? Every time I'm going to draw a sample from a queue that I chose a priori, I'm not going to change that, right? And uh, that's actually one of the reasons why uh, the Q isn't necessarily a very optimal thing. Uh, so in here, I'm going to use a thing called a adaptive Q, so that uh, I'm actually going to sample from a Q that is changing every time I'm sampling it. Okay. So why that's a good idea? It can be justified already very high level from uh, this one. So suppose I'm going to sample from this uh, very you know, uh, multimodal, in this case, uh, bimodal distribution. 
and my proposal you know, is in here. Okay. Of course, you can say, I may have a proposal that is in here. Okay, then that covers both modality, but uh, you, know, you have a lot of uh, white space in here which cause rejection, right? So this is a good proposal because it is uh, uh, you know, somehow you know, enveloping this, uh, this modality. But the problem is that you are going to get samples only from this mode. You cannot move out, right? And uh, what if I have a distribution which is uh, now uh, moving okay, with my sample? Say, I use this one to draw a sample, okay? Then conditioning on this sample, I know that, okay, I've already exploited this space. Next time, I'm going to move away from this space a little bit, okay? So I'm going to have this uh, green proposal which is away from here a little bit. And then from there, I actually draw another new sample. Then I can say, decide whether this sample is to be accepted or not. If it is accepted, that means this is a good sample. It represents the true math in the original distribution. And let's move on to explore either even further along that direction. Then I'm going to sample from here. So in this way, you can see my Q will be each time driven by a different uh, sample obtained from the previous step. And as a result, I'm going to now have a chance to explore another modality, okay? Even though I don't know originally where that modality is, but just by these samples, I'm somehow slipping into that kind of domain, right? And that slippage is automatic because if you are lucky, you get a good sample that is near here, suddenly will tell you, hey, this is a good area for you to explore further because you're going to do a likelihood test you can test whether this sample is valid under the original distribution. And if it is, that pretty much tells you, you know, it is a good area to explore, right? And uh, that kind of tells you how awkward the original proposal is because uh, even if you sample, get a sample from here, you know, from this uh, red density, it is still possible to get a sample from here, very small probability. But even if you're lucky, you get a sample from here, you're going to pull back next time because uh, you fail to adjust your distribution, right? So now I made the, the proposal and distribution adjustable. That's the key idea under MCMC. So this is a heuristic. The big story is that how to uh, make it uh, uh, principled. So let me begin with uh, presenting you the algorithm, okay? And uh, then I'm going to show you this algorithm is correct. It's going to guarantee you to do the right thing, okay? So here is the algorithm. It is, uh, called uh, metropolis hasting. By the way, there's a rich history of this algorithm. Metropolis and hasting, I forgot which one is which. One of them is not even a statistician, not a scientist. One of them is a physicist who was in the Manhattan Project. The other one was his uh, boss. It was uh, maybe a general, maybe a manager or something. But uh, in order to make the paper published, his name has to be there. So that's, uh, that's the folk story. I'm not, I didn't validate it myself, but I, 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 I choose to believe it because it's fun to believe. Uh, so, from the origin, you can see this uh, algorithm was used uh, for problems related to atomic physics, nuclear bombs, stuff like that. Why? Because, uh, you know, one of the basic models in nuclear physics is the uh, Ising model, where you have a lot of latent states, and it's too big for you to compute. And uh, what they did is that, okay, let's throw dice multiple times and uh, get a representation uh, of the states in terms of samples. But uh, they are not throwing dice at random. They use the following procedure. So my goal is to get a true distribution P. Did I put it here? Not, not here. So I'm going to put it here. And by the way, this P, X, X itself is a high dimensional state. It's a lot of variables. And uh, I'm going to use a proposal. I draw a sample from here. And then once I draw the sample, I'm going to do a test of acceptance probability. And this uh, test is uh, uh, based on this equation, okay? It is the, the likelihood ratio of uh, uh, coming from uh, the new states, okay, and uh, go back to the older states versus uh, coming from the old states into the new states, okay? That's basically a likelihood ratio test. So it is a different compared to what we had before. What we had before is to directly compute the ratio between Q and P. Here it is not. It is about uh, moving between new samples and old samples, okay, based on both distribution. 
And uh, then uh, I'm going to also, because uh, here there is no way to tell which one is bigger, the whole value may be greater than one, right? If it is greater than one, I'm going to take one. If it is smaller than one, then I'm going to take that smaller value as the acceptance rate, okay? And uh, then uh, I'm going to get a new sample, P of x prime. And, uh, and then next time I'm going to now, uh, let's see. Yeah, so okay, I get an x prime <coughs> from uh, this distribution, x is my O sample. And now I get this x prime, which is accepted, let's say. And then I'm going to now let the x to equal to x prime. Okay, I'm going to now redefine, go back from here. And in my next sample, draw a new x prime from a distribution that is newly conditioned on the new sample. Okay, and I go forever. So this is a metropolis testing, very, very easy. And uh, I have an algorithm so that you can see a time step. Right? Starting from here, I'm going to count the time, and every time I'm going to draw a new sample, do a test, replace you know, the sample uh, with the new one uh, if it is accepted, and then make the transition. What if the sample is not accepted? Because uh, here, it could have uh, a, 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 a chance that the sample was rejected. What if that happens? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, it happens like this. I'm going to now reuse the old sample to recondition and redraw. Okay, and so this whole thing move on. And on. So here is a rough picture about what's happening. So with that procedure, you use this uh, P, uh, this Q kernel, okay, which is conditioned on my first sample x zero, okay, and uh, say it is uh, used to define the center of this sample, uh, this this proposal. Then I'm going to draw x1 from it. And suppose I got a x1, which is in here. Well, if you see x1, it is uh, under pretty high probability in the original distribution, but also under high probability under the, the target distribution. And you can use this equation to, to determine what is the chance of being accepted. And uh, that must be a big number. Then it is uh, somehow accepted. So once this is accepted, I'm going to now redefine the kernel, okay, based on this one. Okay, then I'm going to use this proposal to draw a new sample. And uh, for whatever reason, even though this sample is moving to the wrong direction, it is uh, moving to a direction that is not uh, explored, but uh, this kernel still spread out non-zero probabilities in different domains. And maybe in this case, you got a sample in here, okay? This sample in here has a low probability under red curve, but has a high probability under the, the, the black curve, which is a target. So it still will have a pretty good chance of being accepted, right? And if it is accepted, then now you have a chance to define a new kernel, okay? And you have a new kernel, and uh, then you're going to draw a new sample, okay, which is this x prime, and uh, you plug in x prime into this equation, and uh, because uh, this, uh, you know, you are in the saddle region of that, and maybe the probability of this sample under the original distribution may be not that high. Therefore, the acceptance rate is not that high either. So you are unlucky you get the sample, you know, rejected. Well, if it's rejected, what's going to happen? We we'll just stay with this red uh, proposal, not changing it, redraw again. Well, hopefully next time you are luckier, here, you get a sample maybe from here. Right, then it's going to be under a high probability, but then I give a chance to move further. Let me see what that's what I plan to do. Yes, so you get a new sample in here, right? And uh, if you see such a thing, this is a rare event which may not be happening very often because uh, under the original curve, it is really not very high. But uh, if this uh, rare event happens, you're going to clinch to that and amplify it. Okay, so that's the idea behind MCMC. It allows you to seize this uh, rare chance to move into a, uh, you know, a, a, a paradise, you know, a, a good region. So that happened, then I'm going to now dramatically shift my proposed distribution into this uh, new modality. And that obviously, ov obviously can give you, you know, a better chance of explore here. So, so that's the virtue of MCMC. It is uh, really taking advantage of having a moving proposal, 
okay, determined by my latest sample so that you can have a uh, greater chance of exploring okay, different modality. And uh, that's not at the cost of having a big envelope proposal that costs a lot of your sample to be wasted. Okay, so that's uh, a, uh, uh, a typical uh, kind of uh, demonstration of MCMC. Any questions so far with the algorithm? Yeah. How do you compute your x given x prime? How do I compute x given x prime? You mean here? Oh, remember that uh, your, your proposal distribution is expressed in closed form. You can evaluate it. Right? What do we say that we can, we, you, you just plug in that value and uh, evaluate. What's x? Oh, you are talking about this one, right? Yeah, yeah. because it is a proposal up to my design. I can make it very simple, right? For example, this is a Gaussian distribution, and uh, I use that to define the mean. Then it's very trivial. I just plug in whatever I have to be the mean, right? So here, the Q is meant to be a very simple one that you don't have to do a lot of inference. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, another subtlety you want to realize is that uh, Originally, we say this P is really a headache one. We really don't want to deal with that, right? And uh, we certainly don't want to do inference on that. And sometimes it is so hard that we don't even want to compute uh, a evaluation for that because the partition function can be very hard as well. So computing the likelihood under that unit is by itself also hard. But the nice thing here is that you can see the P is both upstairs and downstairs. And partition function is a constant, they cancel. Right. So all you need to do is this likelihood ratio is that you just plug in the sample, the old sample or the new sample, and compute the likelihood, the, the, the value under a pre-normalized likelihood function. And that's very easy. It's just a bunch of product over potential functions plug in. Right. So that's another virtue. So this whole thing is very, very easy. In fact, uh, that's why <coughs> it got a, a, a big kind of uh, uh, you know, recognition and popularity after it's proposed, you know, you have a bunch of physicists, and then they have, uh, you know, engineers who are high school graduates and all that kind of thing. And uh, then I come in and say, hey, implement this. They were able to do that because it involves very little math. It's almost like mechanical. Okay, for you know, all you need to do is that you can read mathematics. Of course, you need to know what the p look like, and you know how to plug in the value into your p and compute the value. That's it, and you keep running, and magically it converges. So why it is converging? You know, this seems to be too good to be true, right? I mean, uh, uh, using a trivial proposal and uh, doing a test that is also quite trivial to compute, and suddenly I was able to approach a complicated distribution of arbitrary complexity. Why that's true? Right. So for that, let's uh, study a little bit on a theory of that. And uh, I apologize for potential confusions on the theory part, but let's uh, at least give it a try. So uh, it turns out that this algorithm, uh, when it is deployed, it needs to be run in different, uh, in uh, some uh, uh, multiple phases, actually two phases. And again, uh, it's discovered by even an empirical and a data scientist that this is necessary, but uh, they have no problem of doing that. The first phase is called burn-in. You just use the previous procedure, okay, and uh, just keep running it. But uh, Somehow, you, after you run it, you throw it a sample. You don't keep it. Because uh, uh, people had this intuition that uh, <coughs> the sample are not actually truly from P. Then after you run that for a few thousand times, you actually are into a comfortable zone where the sample are actually coming from P. Okay, then the burning period is uh, completed. You're going to now guarantee to have samples coming from P. So, uh, so what, what is happening under this that? Why there is this intuition and uh, how to actually exercise? All right, so uh, let's uh, study uh, the theory a little bit. First, let, let's understand why it is called a Markov chain Monte Carlo. Originally, our method was called Monte Carlo. And here we have Markov chain Monte Carlo. Why is that? Well, it is because every time we're going to use a new sample to redefine the proposal, and therefore, your current proposal 
is uh, conditionally independent of anything you did before other than the previous sample you are having. And this is known as a Markov property, right? And uh, you can also say that uh, all these samples is actually forming a Markov chain, right? Every sample is conditionally independent of the previous one given this one, okay? So that's the first thing. And uh, the second thing is that uh, we need to study why using you know, a, uh, a transition kernel, okay, you know, from the old sample to the new sample will eventually get us to the, the, new, the, the, the correct distribution. So let me ask you this. You know, here I wrote P of x n given x n minus 1. What does this uh, whole thing look like in our earlier algorithm? What is the transition probability under a metropolis hasting algorithm? So it is a Q multiplied by the A. A is the acceptance function, right? Right. And uh, we call them transition kernel, T of uh, X to XT prime, okay? And uh, we're going to study, you know, are there anything in the design of the T that ensures that uh, I can actually get to the right distribution no matter how I started the distribution? That's actually very magic you start from an arbitrary distribution because the first uh, Q in the zero time point is not depending on anything, right? You don't have any sample to depend from. So therefore, you have to start from somewhere depending on nothing. And uh, the MCMC theory tells that regardless of where you start from, as long as you use a right transition kernel defined by the machop hasting, you are going to, so here is the X0, Okay, and I go down and down, down into this Markov chain, this is MC. I'm going to eventually get uh, Xn, which actually come from uh, P of X. Okay, now that is actually what we are going to achieve, okay, using this algorithm. Clear about the goal? All right, so now let's show uh, a theory, why, uh, how that can be happening. The theory, uh, requires uh, some uh, uh, concepts, and uh, let's uh, uh, introduce a few of them. The first concept is called uh, 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 equilibrium distribution. How do I call it here? I forgot how I say it. Oh, the stationary distribution. Sometimes I also call it equilibrium distribution. Basically, uh, it should first guarantee the following, you know, If you know you come from uh, you are in this distribution, you are going to still keep sampling, right? And you are going to get uh, you know, t of uh, n plus t, also coming from uh, p of x, right? That's basically how you keep getting samples from the right distribution. Somehow there is a magic moment that you come from a arbitrary distribution and you are into the right distribution and you're going to draw sample from the right distribution for many times. But still, you, but the procedure you use is not changing. You are using the same procedure here and here to draw samples. Right. So I'm going to show you first what can happen, you know, to allow you uh, to make sure that uh, when you are in here already, you can always be in the same distribution based on a proper transition kernel. Okay. So here is uh, what uh, uh, the equilibrium distribution is telling you. It says that, uh, you know. We, there exists some distribution which is called a stationary if uh, a transition probability has the following kind of character. You are going to you know, start from a initial distribution P of X and uh, using the X to drive a transition kernel. And then regardless of uh, what X you use, you are going to actually lead to a new distribution which is actually the same distribution as your initial distribution. Okay, have a problem with understanding that? This is called a state. Any distribution that is uh, having this property is called a stationary distribution. Basically mean that you come from distribution, you apply a transition kernel conditionally on a sample from distribution, you are getting a sample that is from the same distribution. 
okay? And uh, for this to happen, you need to have a specific T, okay? And uh, once T satisfies this, you know, you basically will have an equilibrium state, which allow you to, you know, do this part. You can keep sampling from the right distribution, okay, once you are already in the right distribution. All right, and then we have a few other concepts. The first one is called the irreducibility. It's basically uh, the property characterizing a Markov chain. Remember, now we call this a sequence of samples, x1 all the way to xn to be a Markov chain, right? And uh, in every of this uh, sample, it's basically, remember, this is called a state okay, of the distribution. Of course, this is a vector of many variables, but it is a realization of all the variables right, in that space. And now we say that, uh, you know, certainly for this uh, x variable, it can take many, many values, right? And uh, these are called uh, different states. And uh, the whole value, the x equals to basically, let's maybe take an R of uh, k. It is a state space of all the you know, random variables. Now we're going to state a property of that state space, okay? Uh, if not, because here we are doing a Markov chain, which amounts to moving from one state to another state. And eventually we want to populate the whole state space so that your samples are, you know, kind of uh, faithfully reflecting the true distribution, right? And you can imagine if I have uh, such a sample space and, uh, you know, there are values in here in any places, what if my sample are only covering this space but not here? If that's true, then what's going to happen? You are going to have a irrepresentative set of samples, right? You really want to be able to use sample to cover the entire thing. But here, we are basically running a Markov chain, which implies that uh, the mechanism to get the next sample is to be conditioned on the previous sample. It means that uh, we are basically each time using a sample to move to the next one, and to the next one, to the other one, to the other one. And such moving shouldn't prevent us from uh, coming from here to the other side. Right. So that's basically what uh, this few definitions are trying to say. Irreducible, irreducibility is a Markov chain which says that uh, all the states you know, in, the, in, the, in, in the distribution uh, can be reachable with probability bigger than one. Meaning that uh, in this entire space, every state is reachable. Okay, that's the first thing. And reachable from any other states okay, with, with non-zero probability. And the, the second one is uh, called uh, aperiodic aperiodicity, which means that uh, suppose I have two states in here, and uh, if uh, such thing happened that the transition allow me to come from, me use another color, if the transition allow me to come from here to here, and then here to here, and only that, then what's going to happen? It has become a sink. So once uh, you are in this space and uh, for some reason you stepped into this part, then there is no way to come out because it's going to be cycling in these two states. Right? So we must you know, uh, insist that uh, the Markov chain is uh, aperiodic. Okay? Such thing shouldn't happen. Okay? How to prevent such thing happening? You need to define the right transition kernel right, to prevent transitioning to behave in a periodic way. All right, so and uh, if you know, a Markov chain is both irreducible and aperiodic, then it is called a agoric Markov chain, okay? And uh, for the MCMC algorithm to work, you must design a Markov chain that is agoric. Okay, so that's basically uh, our goal. And uh, agoricity means that, uh, you know, actually, once your chain is agoric, then it implies a very, very important property, which means that you can reach the stationary distribution pi no matter what the initial distribution you actually start from. That's actually a very, very interesting property. You can start from anything, any arbitrary distribution over x, and then eventually you are going to converge at this uh, target distribution of x. Okay. So uh, let's see uh, why that's true. 
Any questions so far in terms of the concepts? No? OK, good. <clears throat> OK, so uh, let's uh, introduce one more concept called the reversibility. Reversibility means that uh, you know, a Markov chain is reversible if there is a distribution pi of x such that given a transition kernel t from uh, x prime to x, to x, you have uh, this equality, meaning that uh, you draw sample from that distribution and you actually uh, you know, use the transition kernel to move to the other states. The probability of uh, these two events will be the same as uh, you start from the sample you arrived at and revert the process. Okay, you come from, uh, you are using, now you know, starting from uh, the target distribution, you know, from uh, the sample you draw, and then use that condition and move from the sample you're initially coming from. And uh, in these two cases, the joint probability is the same. Okay, so that basically means that, uh, you know, when you are in a Markov chain, coming from here and to here, and the coming from here to here, has the same probability, probability. Okay. <clears throat> and then now we can prove some important concepts. It basically says that uh, if the Markov chain is reversible, like what you have in here, and this, by the way, this uh, reversible uh, Markov chain is also called detailed balance. This condition is called detailed balance, okay? And uh, if, you know, a distribution and uh, the transition probability together satisfy detailed balance, then you can always actually prove, you know, the existence of a stationary distribution, meaning that uh, you have uh, this property. A stationary distribution, by definition, is that uh, you come out of that distribution you use uh, a transition kernel conditioned on the sample from that distribution, you back to the, go back to the same distribution. Okay, so this is the definition of a stationary distribution. Meaning that uh, no matter what you do, you cannot get into another distribution. Okay, and uh, such a nice property happens when your Markov chain is uh, reversible. And here is a very simple proof. Starting from the detailed balance, you know, and then you just do a trivial marginalization of one of the states. It could be x or x prime. Either way, it's fine. In this case, I use x. Okay, so marginalization on the left-hand side gives you a trivial answer because uh, this one has no x. It goes out, and therefore, you are going to sum over this transition probability that is uh, having an argument on x, and it sum to one, right? And therefore, on the left-hand side, you have only this part. And uh, on the right-hand side, you have uh, just this copy down. Okay, very, very trivial definition. So with all that, now <clears throat> we understand you know, if you can come up with a Markov chain and uh, if you design the transition probability kernel T such that they satisfy a detailed balance, then you are going to have a stationary distribution okay, uh, that is uh, you know, uh, uh, defined by uh, you know, a component here in the detailed balance. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to establish the claim that the metropolis hasting procedure that I told you before is realizing such a reversible Markov chain. Okay, so here the transition kernel is a Q times A, and the A is this, right? So this actually needs some uh, more interesting look, right? So uh, what can happen to this part? And this is actually a kind of a, a very awkward function, which is not uh, very analytical, right? It's almost like a choice, you know, two-way choice. You can either be one or something. So it's uh, interesting to maybe look into the composition of this function. It has uh, two components. One is a one, the other is this. When are you going to take this value instead of one? Any insight? Just by definition, you can, you can give a guess, right? So maybe the other way around to ask, where, when, when you know, this A, transition probability, is less than one, 
than what happens. It must be that this thing, this guy is also less than one. Right? Because if it is bigger than one, then A has to be one. Right? So now we cannot have this uh, observation. If this guy is uh, smaller or equal to one, in fact, you can ignore the equality, just focus on the, 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 the less uh, property. Then we can say that uh, the, 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 the inverse of this is greater than one. Okay. All right, and uh, then if this one is uh, greater than one, then you know, the, you know the, the reverse transition probability from uh, uh, x prime to x must equal to one, right? Because uh, if this equal to one, then the inverse of that is less than one, then this guy will be actually greater than one. Therefore, this one must be equal to one. So it's a whole mouse of words, but now you can reasoning that uh, you know there is a simple way to actually uh, categorize the two possible behaviors of uh, this guy. Right? It can be either smaller than one or greater than one, and if it is greater than one, then we just accept the whole sample with probability A equal to one. Right? So that basically allows us to now replace the, the transition kernel with a closed form expression. Right? So let's suppose that uh, this one is equal to less than one, and this one is greater than one, uh, is equal to one, that's the only thing that you can happen. Or the other way around, if you believe this equals to one, then that one must be less than one, right? Then you plug in, you know, A is by definition, this guy, you know, if uh, this is true, then you now multiply, uh, uh, you, you, you basically uh, turn this into this equality by multiplying the denominator here to the left-hand side, and you have uh, this part equal to that part. Okay, and uh, then what, what else do you see? Uh, uh, okay, and uh, here uh, you are missing a one, right? You can, you can always multiply that by one. Right? And the uh, one is basically the transition probability from x prime to x. Therefore, I actually brought in this term in here, right? So now you can see, what is this? This is by definition of a transition kernel from x to x prime, right? And here is the transition kernel from x prime to x, right? And therefore, we have this and that. And then we have already proved the detailed balance, right? So a Markov chain enabled by a metropolis hasting procedure satisfies this uh, detailed balance property. And also, detailed balance implied the existence of an equilibrium distribution. And in this case, what is the equilibrium distribution? The equilibrium distribution is the P itself. It is our target distribution. Right. So that's basically the whole rationale. You know, you actually design a very interesting transition kernel to make sure that the stationary distribution of this Markov chain will actually <clears throat> be the true target distribution that you are interested in making inference on or drawing samples from. Okay. All right, so uh, that basically finished the proof. MCMC algorithm will eventually converge to the true distribution here. And uh, what is uh, uh, nice about a stationary distribution, which I haven't really uh, uh, show you a detailed proof, but you are welcome to go through the reference book, is that if I already have sample from the equilibrium, then I'm going to stay in equilibrium, right? But if I have sample that is not in equilibrium, for example, what if my sample here is not from P? Well, I will get closer and closer to this P, okay, because it is a, you know, attraction you know, kind of property, just like the fixed point iteration. You're going to iterate, iterate until you converge to a fixed point. Here, the convergence P is this. Okay. So that's why, you know, you have this, uh, you know, algorithm that uh, you can draw a sample from an arbitrary initial distribution, and your P, uh, your Q is adjusting itself every time, you know, by conditioning a new sample, and then it will eventually drag you into this, uh, you know, uh, stationary distribution. All right, any, any questions on the theory part? 
and also the algorithm part. If not, I think we are okay to maybe do a few exercises just to see in operation how this thing whole carries through. Okay. Of course, there are some caveats. Uh, I said there is this a burning period because uh, my x0 is certainly coming from a queue that is uh, you know, following nothing. And uh, my x1 may be also coming from a queue that is conditioning on x0, which is uh, not quite right yet because x0 is not from p. Right? Eventually, after many, many, many steps, I'm going to have a xt, which comes from uh, you know, a queue of uh, x and uh, xt minus 1. And I'm hoping that this uh, xt minus 1 is already following p of x. So when that magical moment happen, this is basically the, the period you call burning, right? You need to burn in the whole sampling, the MCMC, so that it will reach to a status where all samples are coming from the true distribution. And then once it is there, it's going to stay in the stationary. So when does this happen? Well, unfortunately, there is no theory saying that. Okay, there isn't a theory uh, saying, at least in the generic sense, uh, what is the convergence rate of MCMC. There are theory for a very few, very special distributions, such as your sound from, sample from a, uh, a Gaussian, from a different Gaussian, and that kind of analysis can exist. But the generically, you don't have an analysis on uh, how long it takes to, to, burn, to burn in. Then here, the art kicks in. As an experienced MCM sealer, you are going to just uh, you know, try, you know, for me, I typically try 5,000 to 10,000 samples, okay, and throw them away, and uh, then I'm going to <coughs> save all the rest of samples. <coughs> but uh, later on, I'm going to show you some diagnostic plots to tell you actually when you should uh, uh, you know, start collecting sample and when to stop. All right, so now with uh, MCMC as the cover kind of uh, story, I'm going to show you one more algorithm which is even more easy to operate. Okay, the MCMC uh, with actually Monte Carlo, uh, no, Metropolis Hastings is already quite easy to, to, to perform, right? You all you need is a queue, and uh, you're going to use this A to uh, test whether the sample from Q is going to be rejected or accepted. Quite easy. Now I'm going to show you even an uh, easier one, okay, in which this uh, A function is uh, vanished. A is always equal to one. You're going to accept every sample, okay, and your Q is also pretty straightforward. And uh, so how do I say that? Okay, so here is the story. In fact, I, I wrote the algorithm here, um, but I'm going to just uh, 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 articulate it, you know, using just a you know, trivial example. So your X, it's basically a multivariate uh, vector. It's a graphical model, right? So uh, from x1, x2, all the way to xn, uh, or xk, let's say, k random variables. And uh, uh, let's imagine we're already, forget about the burning and, uh, and the equilibrium. Let's already say it, it is already from the sample, from the dis true distribution. Now how do I draw from there, okay? So I'm going to draw the following. I'm going to start from somewhere, x1, where, you know, all my x other than one of them is already initialized. It is already having a value. Okay, I'm going to draw this one only. And I'm going to draw it from uh, x1 equal to, uh, x1 equal to p of, uh, no, no, not equal to, but uh, following a distribution p of uh, x1 conditioning on x minus 1, all the rest of the random variables. So I'm going to draw basically, first of all, random variables not as a vector entirely. In the Machops case team, we need to treat this x entirely as a subject to be sampled from. And here I'm breaking it down. I'm looking at each of the variables in that random vector. Okay, I'm going to draw it one by one. So I draw from the first one, conditioning on the rest of that. Okay, and once I have the first one drawn, I'm going to throw away the old x1 and replace that with the newly drawn x1 because it is always accepted. I'm going to start visiting x2 and I'm going to draw 
x2. So I call this a time step one. Okay. It's coming from uh, uh, x2 divided by a uh, condition on uh, x1 time one and all the other x3, x4 in the previous time step. Okay. So you can imagine that uh, I'm going to swipe through the entire list of random variables each time touch one and uh, use the old value of the other one to form a conditional distribution. And what is this conditional distribution? Well, it is uh, in the graphic model. We know actually how to do that, right? And uh, here, does it involve any inference? It does not, because uh, all the things being conditioned are plugged in, right? And uh, all you need to do is to use the original definition of the graphical model and uh, uh, just uh, plug in the value and compute what's the value of the probability of this particular state that you are interested in drawing sample from. And uh, I have some other sentences, but maybe uh, we should just look at an example in here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here is the algorithm. Maybe that's easier to, remember the same thing I think I already had. I still use a sample, so this is better. So suppose I have a time t uh, equal to zero. I already have uh, some samples populated, okay? And this is my network. And uh, again, you know that uh, this defines a big joint distribution due to a multiplication of all the potential for all the local condition nodes, right? And uh, now I'm going to start drawing the next sample. And uh, in my second uh, iteration of the Gibbs sampling, instead of drawing the whole thing from uh, this uh, joint distribution, I'm going to draw first the xb from p of uh, xb, given everything other than xb. So xb is here, right? Given everything in the network, what is that distribution? Mm -hmm. What is the uh, conditional distribution of xb given all the other four random variables? How do you write it? This is something that requires some uh, recollection of your old knowledge, right? We spent some lectures talking about uh, representations in graphic models, and uh, we talk about uh, some uh, conditional independence properties encoded by the graph. We say that uh, a graphical model, one of the major virtue is uh, to make explicit certain random variables are conditionally independent of others, okay, if uh, something is uh, given. So in this case, you know, I'm going to sample from uh, P of B, XB. I have everything that is remaining from the previous sample already, right? So do you find uh, the conditional independence property useful? in this case. So we basically learned that uh, you know, the conditional probability of any random variable given the rest of the random variable in the graphic model equals to the conditional probability of that random variable given its Markov blanket. Right? Therefore, what is the Markov blanket of B? It's children and the co-parents, right? So, we're going to now have a P of a X, B given A and a E only, right? That's a much simpler distribution to write. And I'm sure you know how to write it. I think uh, here we already have it. You know, P of, you know, P of B given A, E is proportional to, you know, just uh, multiply the basic network components, right? The condition of A given B, E times B, which is a node in here and the common child. And the proportional means that uh, here we need some normalization to make sure that uh, they normalize, right? So you draw that distribution. You know, here I already gave you an example, right? You, because uh, what, what comes here, you know, why, why you have there? Because uh, A and E already assigned a value from the previous sample. So you plug it in here, right? And uh, you draw basically two, two samples, either, uh, and actually you compute the probability of two samples, two outcomes, either false or true. And uh, these are the numbers. You draw a sample. Obviously, having force is more often, so you plug a four here, a F here, and then you move on to the next sample. Next sample is E. What is the Markov blanket of E? A and B, right? 
And now your B is no longer, uh, it's actually it's still F, but it's a new F. It's not the old F, right? So uh, you're going to now plug in here and the redraw B. And the next, you're going to, you know, go to A. Well, A is a little bit tricky. It's Markov flunked is everything. And be it. Okay, so be it. Everything, this is after all a four node network. In the much bigger network, you may still have a chance to save, right? So uh, you plug, but uh, again, thanks to the Bayesian network law, writing this down is pretty easy, right? Just plug in everything, like here, and do a normalization. So you draw a sample here. And then you go to the last sample, last two. And now, up to here, you had the one iteration of Gibbs sampling, right? So the differences of this one versus the metropolis hasting is that in, <coughs> in metropolis hasting, this whole thing, X, has to be drawn all together from some way, okay? And here, Gibbs is a, uh, a algorithm which allows you to draw the variables inside X one by one using this uh, very easy conditional distribution, which is further simplified by the Markov blanket. Okay? All right. And uh, you can do this and do that. And by the way, uh, I, I, I neglect a, a, a claim early on in here, which says that uh, you can do raw black hole radiation of so on and so forth. What does that mean? That means uh, if for, for whatever reason, you don't want to draw this anymore. Say this is for whatever reason. Uh, uh, in this case, it doesn't stand because they are all the same. They are all like a discrete distribution. But imagine a complex distribution where you know you have a discrete in here, 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 but here it's a Gaussian distribution of some continuous random variable. Say uh, I don't know. Uh, conditioning on the label of here, you may go uh, a uh, you know this guy is uh, not making calls now. Maybe he's. Uh, 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 consuming a certain amount of food, for example. Okay, that's a Gaussian distribution. If he's in good mood, uh, if alarm's on, he's not going to eat much. Otherwise, he'll eat a lot. So it's a mixture of two Gaussians, right? So in this case, you can maybe uh, sample it from Gaussian if you think it's too troublesome, too boring. You can integrate out Gaussian random variable, right? Because, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a normal distribution, you know, defined by, you know, J, you know, conditioning on A, is pretty easy to compute, right? So you then don't sample that. That's basically meaning that uh, the, in Gibbs sampling, you can sample each one and the raw black or rice other ones. All right, with that, we have now two algorithms. And uh, I have another nine minutes. I could do two things. I can show you yet another example of this uh, very interesting Gibbs sampler to the model we actually see before, the topic model. Or I can show you the theory behind Gibbs sampling to also convince you this is a correct practice to make sure the sample come from the right distribution. Which way do you want to go? You want to see one more example? All right. Uh, then we, we can leave the series to next lecture then, okay? So uh, this is a distribution or a model we uh, described in last lecture, right? You hopefully know, uh, not last lecture, but a few lectures ago. Hopefully you know all the semantics, right? Topic model, you know, uh, we assume that uh, every article is a bag of words and every word is uh, having its uh, word topic indicator. And once I indicate this word to be a particular topic, I'm going to sample that word from a word frequency distribution specific to every topic. And then on the article level, every article has this pi, which is uh, uh, the topic vector, or topic mixing vector, suggesting that uh, the document can have multiple topics. Right? And the, the, the word specific topic indicator actually comes from that, uh, that pi distribution. And then with, with being Bayesian, therefore we define a prior for pi and a prior for b. That's the whole model. Very, very easy, right? And uh, just realize that uh, here uh, we have a Dirichlet, right, over the pi. And uh, in here, what distribution we use? It's a multinomial over the z, right? And uh, here we also have a multinomial over the w, right? And the, this, these multinomials, are, of course, are conditioned on 
uh, which topic they come from. Therefore, it is uh, conditioned. Okay, at the end of the day, we need to sample all this. In fact, we need to sample B, pi, and Z, because they are all variables. Okay, so the first story I want to say is that uh, we can do something called a collapsed skip sampling in which this guy and that guy become raw blackerized because I don't want to sample that. Do you know why we don't want to sample that? Because this is a theta, this is pi, this is beta. These are the parameters under a multinomial distribution, right? By definition, they follow a Dirichlet prior, and their posterior is also a Dirichlet because we have a conjugate prior. Therefore, you know, if you sample from the Markov blanket, it should be, say, pi given alpha and the, all the z's, for example. These are all the z's, OK? And, and let me put a bracket of that to mean it is a set. You can certainly sample from that. But uh, pi is a uh, vector of real numbers. And we know from folk wisdom that uh, using sample to represent a real distribution can be very difficult. You need to have a lot of samples right, to make the average and everything make sense. It's not like a discrete thing, one, two, three, four. You just see one, two, three, four, 30 times, you are, you are good enough. But if I have a value that is uh, uh, anywhere between zero and one or infinity, how many samples should draw? I don't know. You know the more the better, basically. Right? So, but on the other hand, we also know that this distribution, even if I can sample from, is actually also a Dirichlet of uh, alpha plus nz, right? Its posterior is also a Dirichlet diffusion, and the parameter is now a combination of the hyperpriors and also the zero counts. Or the, these are the zero counts and the real counts, right? So it is a Dirichlet, and uh, we know actually how to do integration over Dirichlet. Do we? At least uh, you should uh, uh, be able to recover that equation from my slides. It's a gamma distribution. You can really just uh, write it down and do an integration. Therefore. You know, computing this can be happening in closed form. You don't need any sample from. Okay, so that's why you know what's going to happen will be we're going to only draw sample from z and uh, neglect pi and b because once I have all the z's in place, b and the pi can be calculated in closed form. Okay, that tremendously saved my effort in generating enough samples because I need to only worry about uh, the z only, and the, the equation is also very simple. Okay, what is z? If you look at the, the, the model, you know, the p of z given what? Given w, given pi, given b can be written as what? Proportional to p of z given pi, p of w given z and b, right? And uh, so this guy is what? This guy is... Uh, a multinomial. Now I actually marginalized out the pi. Therefore, I should now move on to make it, because I don't have pi anymore, I'm going to write the p of z given alpha and also counts of all the other z's. Right? And this is a subtle thing I hope you can already understand, but I'm not going to talk too much about that. Why actually z is also on this side? Because, uh, you know, if I draw a graphical model, here is the pi, and the pi is going to be used to draw many, many z's. Right here, I use a plate, which uh, makes you feel you are drawing one z, but it's actually a lot of z's. Right? Now, if I'm going to remove this uh, pi, then what's happening is that uh, this z is going to depend on all the other z's. Right? That's why I'm going to say, you know, I sample a z here, then all the rest of the z's should go here. Okay, they go here in the form of counts, how many counts they generated on different topics. So again, this is a pretty trivial multinomial distribution, just reweight it, right? It's basically moving uh, from, uh, uh, actually it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it consists of uh, both the hyper prior weights and also the counts from uh, the rest of the Z. Anyway, so this is a Z and the do beta, you can do the same thing. It's also going to be multinomial. So at the end of the day, you can safely write a proposal in closed form like this. It is proportional to this piece 
which is we call a topic, a doc topic term, which is for every document, you have uh, the counts of uh, uh, words from uh, different topics, and uh, these are priors of the topic of the topic of mix, mixing weights. And here is called the word topic term, which tells you how each word is uh, coming from different topics. So here, this W is to you know, basically uh, be combined with the beta to take care of uh, the probability of the words. Okay. Because a word has to be selected by a N, a biotopic, but uh, then we need to say whether this particular word, WI, is uh, uh, in previous samples come from uh, multiple topics, and then under that topic, what's the probability of that word? Okay. Anyway, so this can be actually saved as a homework for you guys to derive. But once you have that, what you need to do is very simple. Right? You are going to now just run this procedure. You have all these word lists. And then in iteration one, you start from a random guess of all the other topic assignments of the Z. And then you are sample window, you're going to sample from the first one. And your equation is here, right? Plug in the n's. The n basically are computed from uh, looking at all these numbers, and then you sample, keep sampling using this equation, right? Right. So this is a you know, just keep moving forward, and uh, you get a lot of uh, samples from uh, the word topic assignment just using this equation on and on. So at the end of the day your inference outcome will be all these uh, tens of thousands of uh, samples for the topical, uh, for the word topics, okay? And then you can do whatever you want. You can now estimate uh, the topic of uh, every document so just by looking at the Z breakdown, how many times they are one, they are two, they are three, right? That gives you a sample estimation of the document, uh, of the document topic. You can also estimate the beta by looking at uh, how many times you know, under a particular topic, a particular word appears, and then collapse all those numbers. Right. So this is a procedure you can see much simpler than the variational procedure we talked about before. Right. There is no a lot of derivation, and therefore it's a very popular algorithm uh, that uh, is guaranteed to converge. Uh, so you may ask why it is guaranteed to converge to the right distribution, and that's the story for next one. In fact, I have a, a slice here already, but uh, because I need to pick up my son, so I have to stop here and uh, save the rest of the slides for next lecture. Okay, any questions on what we covered so far? So I guess the take home message will be, uh, first digest what is metropolitan hasting and what is the Gibbs sampling, and also uh, try to understand the theory behind a markov chain mercado algorithm, for example, uh, why there is a equilibrium distribution and how to achieve equilibrium by designing the right transition kernels. All right? All right, we'll see you next Monday then. <laughs>